morning class. So today we're going to be going over chapter 37, transport operations. EMS operations, knowledge of operational roles and responsibility to ensure pa patient, public, and personal safety. Principles of safely operating in ground ambulance. Risk and responsibilities of emergency response. Risk and responsibilities of transport, air medical, safe air medical trans operations. Criteria for utilize, utilizing air medical response. Medicine applies fundamental knowledge to provide basic, basic emergency care and transportation based on assessment findings for an acutely injured patient. Infectious diseases, awareness of how to decontaminate equipment after treating a patient, how to decontaminate the ambulance and equipment after treating a patient. Today's ambulances are stocked with standard medical supplies, state-of-the-art technology that transmit data directly to the emergency department. So we have what are called Life Pack 12s or Life Pack 15s. Um, they are able to transmit any uh, cardiac 12 leads or EKGs that we we do on a patient directly to the receiving facility. That way, the doctor can look at it and plan on what he wants to do with that patient once we arrive at the hospital. Gives the hospital a little more, more time um, to get all their resources together and be waiting for us uh, when we get to the hospital. Today's emphasis on rapid response places at EMT in great danger and greater danger. Emergency vehicle design and ambulance is a vehicle that is used for treating and transporting patients who need emergency medical care to a hospital. Today's ambulance designs are based on NFPA 1917, standard for automotive ambulances. Enlarged patient compartments, first responder vehicles have personnel and equipment to treat patients until an ambulance can arrive. Components of the modern ambulances, driver's compartment, uh, patient compartment big enough for two EMTs and two supine patients. Uh, basically, you're going to have an uh, area in the middle for the gurney, and then you have a seat or a bench next to you that you can place your second patient, and it's there's a wall in between the patient's compartment and the driver's compartment. Uh, you're also going to have your equipment and supplies, two-way radio communication. That way you could talk with your own dispatch and talk with fire dispatch as well. Designed for maximum safety and comfort. So different types of ambulances, uh, you have your type one, type two, and type three. Um, and it depends on what county you're in and what county um, requests that you operate. Uh, there's certain types of ambulances that they prefer you to operate in. Right now we are in sprinters or vans. Um, we might be going to a box ambulances in the next year or two. Ambulance and licensing or certification standards are established by states. The state star of life emblem is affixed to the sides, rear, and roof of the ambulance. If you guys ever notice this symbol, um, you'll see it occasionally. Um, next time you go in an elevator, look for this symbol. That means there's enough room for a gurney to fit in. Um, if you don't see this symbol, um, probably not a very big elevator. Uh, so if you guys, next time you go in an elevator, look for this symbol and see how big the, uh, the elevator is. Okay, so you got your different types of uh, ambulances, your type one, your type two, and your type three. So phase of ambulance call, preparation for the call, dispatch and route, arrival at scene, transfer of patient, in route to the hospital, uh, at receiving facility, in route to the station and post run. Preparation phase, make sure equipment and supplies are in their proper places and ready for use. So every time you start your shift, the number one thing you're going to do is check your equipment and make sure everything is there. Uh, make sure everything's stocked for you uh, for the day. If items are missing or do not work, they are no use to you or the patient. Store new equipment only after proper instruction on its use and consulting with the medical director. Equipment should be durable and standardized. Store equipment and supplies according to how urgently and how often they are used. Items for life-threatening conditions at the head of the primary stretcher. Items for cardiac care, external bleeding, and blood pressure at the side of the stretcher. So in the back of the ambulance, uh, you're going to have different compartments. Um, usually the airway stuff, uh, like oxygen mask, nasal cannulas, uh, CPAP is, are going to be more towards the uh, middle of the ambulance or more towards the driver's side because that's where your oxygen tree is going to be at. Um, and then all your um, 
trauma stuff is going to be a little further towards the back so it's a little easier for you to reach. Um, it just depends on how the ambulance is set up. So this is why you always go through each ambulance um, at the beginning of your shift so you know where everything is at. So cabinets and drawer fronts should be transparent or labeled, should open easily and close securely. Medical equipment, basic supplies, airway and ventilation equipment, CPR equipment, basic wound care supplies. So you have your suction unit. This is exactly what we carry right here. This is our portable suction unit. So splinting supplies, childbirth supplies, AED. So you have a bunch of different medical supplies here. And it looks like uh, your splinting supplies as well. Medical equipment, patient transfer equipment, medications, jump kit. Uh, so this is going to be your stretcher. This is going to be your jump bag. Every call you go on, you're going to bring your jump bag. It's going to have everything that's inside your ambulance is going to fit right in here. Safety and operations equipment, personal safety equipment, equipment for work areas. So this is going to be the outside compartment. Um, usually for tools for the ambulance, not for your patient. So you have your road flares, um, your safety vests, and your electrical cords as well. Pre-planning navigation equipment, extrication equipment, personnel, at least one EMT in the patient compartment during transport. You're never leaving your patient alone. Um, always someone next to the patient. Two, EMT, two EMTs are strongly recommended. Some services have a non-EMT driver and a single EMT in the patient compartment. Perform daily inspections. Uh, if you're on a call without a certain supply and the patient needs it, um, that's going to be on you. It's not going to be on the crew that gave you the ambulance or the crew that was on it yesterday. Everything is going to be on you. Inspect the cleanliness, quantity, and function of medical equipment and supplies. Review safety precautions, review traffic safety rules and regulations, ensure safety devices are in working order, properly secure oxygen tanks, properly secure all equipment in the cab, rear and compartments. Make sure all your doors are closed, all your windows and compartments are closed. Um, if you leave a compartment open while in transport with a patient, some, some of that stuff could fall out and injure your patient or injure you. Uh, so make sure if you grab stuff out of the cabinet, uh, always close it. Dispatch phase. Dispatch must be easy to access and in service 24 hours a day. May be operated by the local EMS or by a shared service. May serve only one jurisdiction or maybe an area or regional center. Dispatchers should gather and record nature of the call, name, present location, and callback number, location of patient, number of patients, and severity of their conditions. Other pertinent information. En route to the scene, most dangerous phase for EMTs, crashes cause many serious injuries. Fasten seatbelts and shoulder harnesses before moving the ambulance. Review dispatch information. Prepare to assess and care for the patient. Um, so before, when you get dispatched to a call, they're going to give you all your information, your address. Um, look up the call before you start going. Know where you're going. Uh, don't start going code three lights and sirens to a call. And, and then have to uh, turn around or make a U-turn. Um, that, that could cause an accident. Um, always know where you're going. Uh, always have your seatbelt on. Both people inside the front compartment are always looking for traffic as well. Um, you're gonna have to clear each lane when going through an intersection. Um, you're gonna have what's called defensive driving, uh, whoever is driving. Arrive at the scene, perform a scene size up and report your findings to dispatch. Look for safety hazards, evaluate the need for additional units, determine the mechanism, injury, or nature of illness. Evaluate the need for C-spine and follow your standard precautions. Mass casualty incidents or MCIs. Estimate and communicate the number of patients to the incident commander. Request additional units through dispatch. The incident command system will be established. Safe parking, allow efficient traffic flow and control around an emergency scene. Park 100 feet before or past the crash scene. Park uphill and um, upwind and uphill, um, especially for a hazmat scene as well. Do not park alongside a crash scene. 
Park uphill, upwind of hazardous materials, leave warning lights or devices on. Keep a safe distance between the emergency vehicle and operations. Okay, so you wouldn't want to park back here. You want to have a uh, fire truck, if possible, blocking you. Um, this way you could pull the patient out and bring him to the back of your ambulance. If a car hits in a fire truck, the fire truck's not going to move. If a car hits your ambulance, it's probably going to go pretty far. So be aware of your surroundings, especially in traffic, especially on freeways when people are going 80 miles an hour. Stay away from fires, explosive hazards, down wires, and unstable structures. Um, you might have to stage. You might have to wait till the scene is secured either by PD or fire. Uh, set the parking brake. Facilitate emergency medical care and rapid transport from the scene. If it is necessary to block traffic, work quickly and safely. Traffic control. Provide care and ensure scene safety first. Traffic control is intended to ensure orderly traffic flow, warn other drivers, and prevent another crash. Place warning devices on both sides of the crash. Um, also wear your yellow safety vest. This is also part of your protocols as well. Anytime you're on scene of an accident, uh, you're always wearing your yellow safety vest. This could be a fireball fence too as well if you're not wearing your safety vest. Patient must be packaged for transport. Secure the patient to a backboard, scoop stretcher, or wheel the ambulance stretcher. Lift the patient into the compartment. Secure the patient with straps. Always have um, seatbelts on the patient. So you're gonna have normally about three sets of seatbelts, one down by the legs, one, one up here by the thighs or, or waist, and then you're gonna have your chest harness as well. When you're ready to leave with the patient, inform dispatch of number of patients, name of receiving hospital, and beginning mileage of ambulance. Um, it's important to know how many patients you guys have, and if you have any um, anybody riding with you, family member or fire. This way, if you get in an accident, dispatch knows how many people are in the the ambulance, and they could dispatch appropriate resources. Monitor the patient's condition and route. Recheck a stable patient every 15 minutes and every five for an unstable patient. Contact the receiving hospital. That way they can prepare. And um, if they need to ask for any more resources, they can. Do not abandon the patient emotionally. Be aware of the patient's level of need. Delivery phase. Notify dispatch of your arrival at the hospital. Report your arrival to the triage nurse or other arrival personnel. Physically transfer the patient. Present a complete verbal report. Complete a detailed patient care report. So after every call, you're doing a PCR. You're making sure all your um, or your check boxes are marked. Um, remember, this is a legal document. And you guys can be called into court for this. You always want to make sure your reports are filled out completely and detailed. Uh, restock items if possible. So anything you may have used, um, you want to restock. So if you use anything out of your jump bag, make sure you restock that for the next call in case you have to do something on scene. En route to the station, inform dispatch whether you are in service and where you are going. Sometimes uh, we have limited supplies on the ambulances and if we get a serious call and we have to use all those supplies, uh, you can be out of service. If you use all your oxygen, you are out of service. You cannot help a patient. Um, so make sure you know your county protocols, your work protocols, and if you have an extra backup supplies to know if you're in or out of service. Back at the station, clean and disinfect the ambulance and equipment. Uh, normally you're going to do this at the hospital after you drop the patient off and you bring your gurney back to the rig. You're going to clean and disinfect and restock supplies. Post run phase complete and file additional written reports. Inform dispatch again of status, location, and availability. Perform routine inspections. Refuel the vehicle. Key terms cleaning, disinfection, high level disinfection, and sterilization. After each call, strip linens from the stretcher and place them in a plastic bag or designated receptacle. Discard medical waste. Wash contaminated areas with soap and water. Disinfect all non-disposable equipment used for patient care. Clean the stretcher with germicidal, virucidal solution or 1 to 100 bleach dilution. Clean spillage or other 
contamination with one of those same solutions. Create a schedule for routine full cleaning of the emergency vehicle. Uh, so maybe once a week um, or maybe every Monday and Friday, you're going to go through the ambulance, clean it, wipe everything down, take all the stuff out of the cabinets, wipe down in there, wipe down the windows, um, make sure everything's disinfected. That's your work office. You guys don't want to be back there um, when somebody who hasn't cleaned um, or didn't do the proper cleaning after each patient. Create a written policy procedure for cleaning each piece of equipment. Defensive ambulance driving techniques. Ambulance involved in a crash delays patient care may take the lives of EMTs, other motorists, or pedestrians. Driver characteristics. Some states require an emergency vehicle operations course. Other characteristics, physical fitness and alertness. Emotional maturity and st stability. Due regard for the safety of others and preservation of property. Safe driving practices. Speed does not save lives. Good care does. Wear seatbelts and shoulder restraints. Become familiar with how a vehicle accelerates, corners, sways, and stops. Stay in the extreme left-hand lane on multi-lane highways. Um, so every time you get hired by somebody, they're going to send you through what's called an EVOC course. Um, they're going to show you how to use the ambulances. What are the turning points? Um, how fast do you go? How how long it takes you to stop at certain speeds. Uh, siren risk benefit analysis. The decision to activate the emergency lighting and sirens will depend on local protocols, patient condition, anticipated clinical outcome of the patient. So say if a patient is um, unstable or needs to get to hospital, uh, say if they're having a stroke or a heart attack or they're, they were involved in a traumatic event, um, you're probably going to go code three. Driver anticipation. Always assume that motorists around your vehicle have not heard your siren, public address system, or seen you. Always drive defensively. So this is what it means by defensive driving techniques. Always assume that the patient does not, or excuse me, drivers around you do not know that you are coming. Um, remember, if you get in an accident, most likely it's going to be your fault. Um, so this is why we have defensive driving techniques. Cushion of safety. Maintain a safe falling distance from the vehicles in front of you. This is why we do this is because sometimes patients slam on their brakes in front of you. And if you're tailgating them, that's going to cause an accident. Um, try to avoid being tailgated from behind. Sometimes people see lights and sirens and they'll drive behind you because it clears traffic for them. Ensure that blind spots do not prevent you from seeing vehicles or pedestrians. Never get out of the ambulance to confront a driver. Be aware of blind spots and scan mirrors frequently. Excessive speed is unnecessary, is dangerous, and does not increase the patient's chance of survival. Uh, it makes it difficult to provide care in the patient compartment, hinders the driver's reaction time, increases the time and distance needed to stop the ambulance. So, when you guys get your license, um, you guys are going to have to go to the DMV and get an ambulance driver license. So basically, you guys are going to have to um, read this little handbook. They're going to go to make you take a test on it, and then you'll get your ambulance driver license test. So you can only go uh, 10 miles above the posted speed limit. So say if you're on the highway and it's 65, you're only allowed to go 75. If you're in a residential area and the posted speed limit is 25, you can only go 35. Um, also on the back of the ambulance, everything is amplified. Um, any turn, any speeding um, is going to be amplified for the patient in the back and for your caregiver in the back, your EMT, your paramedic. Um, so please be mindful of that. Um, and it does make it difficult to provide care in the patient compartment. Siren syndrome causes drivers to drive faster in the presence of sirens due to increased anxiety. Vehicle size and distance judgment crashes often occur when the vehicle is backing up. So use a spotter. Always use a spotter. This is actually against the law if you guys do not use a spotter. It's in your ambulance driver handbook. Size and weight influence braking and stopping distances. Uh, so the heavier ambulances, the vans we have are able to stop a little quicker. Uh, but once we go to boxes, they're gonna you're gonna have to stop a little for, um, 
a little earlier due to the increased weight. Okay, road positioning cornering to keep the ambulance in the proper lane when turning, enter high in the lane and exit low. Weather and road conditions, ambulances have a longer braking time and stopping distance. The weight of the ambulance is unevenly distributed, which makes it more prone to roll over. Be alert for hydroplaning, water on the roadway, decreased visibility, and ice and slippery surfaces. Laws and regulations, if you aren't on emergency call and are using your warning lights and sirens, you may be allowed to do the following. Park or stand in an illegal location. Proceed through a red light or stop sign after a complete stop. Uh, you may, you want to make sure you clear the intersection. You're going to clear each lane. Uh, drive faster than the speed limit. Drive against the flow of traffic. Travel left of center to make an illegal pass. An emergency vehicle is never allowed to pass on a school bus that has stopped to load or unload children. Use of warning lights and sirens. The unit must be on a true emergency call. Both audible and visual warning devices must be used simultaneously. The unit must be operated with regard to other safety. Right of way privileges. Emergency vehicles have the right to disregard the rules of the road when responding to an emergency. Do not endanger people or property under any circumstances. Get to know your local right of way privileges. Use of escorts. Use escorts as a guide only when you are in unfamiliar territory. Sometimes when PD's on scene, they'll, they'll ask to either um, follow you if you feel like you need uh, PD supervision on some, some calls, or they can also guide you. Um, they'll go lights and sirens for you just ahead of you um, to clear out traffic. Intersection hazards. Intersection crashes are the most common and most serious. If you cannot wait for traffic lights to change, come to a brief stop and look for pedestrians or other hazards. Um, remember, you're always making sure defensive driving techniques. You want to clear each lane and make sure there's no pedestrians or other hazards involved. Highways. Shut down your emergency lights and sirens until you have reached the far left lane. So as soon as you get on the on-ramp, uh, you're shutting down uh, your lights and sirens and then you're gonna get over the far lane as soon as possible. And then you could go ahead and turn on your lights and sirens. Unpaved roads operate at lower speed with a firm grip on the steering wheel. School zones, it is unlawful to exceed the speed limit. Uh, so this is the only um, area that you cannot exceed the speed limit it's in a school zone. Distractions. Focus on driving and anticipating roadway hazards. Minimize distractions from mobile dispatch terminals and GPS. Mounted mobile radio, stereo, cell phone, eating and drinking. Driving alone it is your responsibility to focus on figuring out the safest route while mentally preparing for the call. Such situations demand your complete attention and focus. Fatigue. Recognize when you are fatigued and alert your partner or supervisor. You should be placed out of service for the remainder of the shift or until the feed fatigue has passed and you feel capable of operating the vehicle safety. There are fatigue uh, policies placed um, normally in every contract. We have a fatigue policy where we could call in and say we're fatigued and we get four hours to rest um, before they could put us back on a call. Air medical operations. Air ambulances are used to evacuate medical and trauma patients. You have fixed wing units and rotor wing units or helos or helicopters. Especially trained crews accompany air ambulance flights. EMTs provide ground support. Uh, so usually you're going to either get a flight paramedic or a flight nurse. Sometimes you're going to get two flight nurses. Medical evacuation or medevac is performed by helicopters. Capabilities, protocols, and procedures vary. Why call for a medevac? Transportation time by ground is too long. So anything normally longer than about an hour to the nearest specialty center, whatever the patient may be experience, experiencing, um, you might call for that. Road traffic or environmental conditions prohibit the use of ground transport. The patient requires advanced care. So if you're two EMTs on scene um, and they require some medical procedure that's outside your scope of practice, it's another reason to call. Multiple patients will overwhelm the resources at the hospital reachable by ground transport. Who receives a medevac? Patients with time-dependent injuries or illnesses, patients with stroke, heart attack, or spinal cord injury, 
Scuba diving accidents, near drownings, or skiing in wilderness accidents. Trauma patients, candidates for limb re replantation, burn center, hyperbaric chamber, or venomous bite center. Whom do you call? Generally, dispatchers should be notified first. In some regions, EMS may be able to communicate with the flight crew after initiating the medevac request. Establish a landing zone, hard or grassy level surface between 60 to 60 feet and 100 to 100 feet. It's recommended. Clear to loose debris, clear of overhead or tall hazards. Um, also, make sure you want to get them away from power lines if possible. Mark the landing site using cones or vehicles. Never use caution tape or people to mark the site. Do not use flares. Move non-essential persons and vehicles. Communicate the direction of strong wind to the flight crew. Landing zone safety and patient transfer. Keep a safe distance between uh, from the aircraft whenever it is on the ground and hot. Stay away from the tail rotor. Always um, keep your head down as well. Those things um, come down to the ground a little low as well. Always approach the helicopter from the front. This way the pilot can see you. Um, and he could tell you either to stop or to keep coming or which side to go on. So this is what I was saying. The main rotor, rotor blades can dip to as low as four feet off the ground. So when they're coming down, um, make sure you keep your head down. Um, approach crouched, approach from the front so the pilot can see you and he'll direct you. If he tells you to stop or to, to keep coming, then also want to stay from the back. Tail rotor blades move so quickly that they appear invisible. Keep the following guidelines in mind. Become familiar with hand signals. Do not approach the helicopter unless instructed and accompanied by flight crew. Make certain that all equipment and the patient are secured to the stretcher. Smoking, open lights or flames, and flares are prohibited within 50 feet. Wear eye protection. So here's some of your uh, signals. Night landings. Do not shine spotlights, flashlights, or any other lights in the air to help the pilot. Direct low intensity highlights or lanterns towards the ground. Illuminate overhead hazards or obstructions if possible. Landing on uneven ground. The main rudder blade will be close to the ground on the uphill side. Approach from the downhill side only. So you're going to approach from this side, from the downhill. Medivacs at hazardous materials incidents, notify the flight crew. Consult about the best approach and distance from the scene. Landing zones should be uphill and upwind. Decontaminate patients before loading them into the helicopter. Remember, you're not going to bring a contaminated patient to the hospital, so don't bring a contaminated patient into a helicopter. Medevac issues. Assess the severity of the weather and environmental terrain. Most helicopters are limited to flying at 10,000 feet above sea level. Medevac helicopters fly between 130 and 150 miles an hour. Because the cabins can find space, assess the number and size of the patients who can be safely transported in a medevac helicopter. Typical medevac flights are extremely expensive compared to ambulance transports. Another thing to be aware of, too, is how heavy is your patient. They do have a weight limit on these things. Um, anybody who's bigger than 250 pounds is most likely going to be denied um, a helicopter ride. So you might have to ground transport that patient. So know your weight limit as well. Okay, all the following are examples of standard patient transfer equipment except. So A, each ambulance should carry a primary wheeled ambulance stretcher, a wheeled stair chair, a long backboard and a short backboard or a short immobilization device. A Stokes basket, also called a basket stretcher. It's a specialized piece of equipment that is used for moving patients up or down rough terrain. Most ambulances do not carry Stokes baskets. They are usually carried by rescue vehicles or fire apparatus. The primary purpose of a jump kit is to
So remember, what does a jump kick carry? What is the purpose of it? So D, think of a jump kit as a five minute kit containing anything you might need in the first five minutes with the patient. It is during that five minute period that you will find and manage immediate life threats. So this is kind of another trick question that NRMT is gonna to have too. Um, it's, you're going to have all, available all the equipment that you will use in the entire call. Excuse me. So remember, read read this carefully. You're going to have all the available equipment um, that you're going to need um, during the call because everything's going to be inside that jump bag. Um, but you only need the equipment to manage immediate life threats during the first five minutes. And you're going to have more backup supplies in your ambulance. You have been dispatched to a call for an unresponsive patient. What is the most important information that you should obtain from the dispatcher initially? So D, all the choices listed in this question are important question to ask dispatch. However, you must first determine the exact location of the patient. You cannot help the patient you cannot find him or her. While in rally, you should try to ascertain more specific, specific patient information, e.g. whether the patient is breathing or not. While en route to a call for a major motor vehicle collision, the most important safety precaution is that you and your partner can take is slash R. Remember, know what the, the question is asking. So D, then, route seen to the phase of the call as the most dangerous, regardless of the nature of the call to which you're responding. Wearing seatbelts and shoulder harnesses is, is the most important safety precaution that you and your partner must take. Furthermore, you must drive defensively and remain aware of the traffic around you. Which of the following is not a guideline for safe ambulance driving? <laughs> so C, avoid one-way streets. They may become clogged. Uh, do not go against the flow of traffic on a one-way street unless absolutely necessary. This also pre presents a very dangerous uh, scenario. Um, at what speed will the ambulance begin to hydroplane when there is no water present on the roadway? So B, at speeds of 30 miles an hour or greater, the tires can lift up off the pavement as water piles up under the tires. It takes control out of the driver's hands. If hydroplane occurs, you should gradually slow down instead of jamming on the brakes to avoid losing control of the vehicle. Most common and often most serious ambulance crashes occur at... This is probably going to be a, a question on your ambulance driver license test. So B, most serious ambulance crashes occur at intersections. Always be alert and careful when approaching an intersection, whether at an intersection with stoplights or stop signs. You should momentarily come to a complete stop, look in both directions for other motorists or pedestrians, then carefully proceed through the intersection. The recommended dimensions for a helicopter landing zone are Remember, this was in the presentation earlier. So C, the recommended dimensions for a helicopter landing zone are 100 by 100 feet on a hard or grassy surface that is level. 
The landing zone should be clear of loose debris and power lines. Which of the following statements about helicopters is true? So A, because the main rotor blade of a helicopter is flexible, can dip as low as four feet from the ground. Use extreme caution when approaching a helicopter with the rotors on. The helicopter must land on a grade approach from the downhill side. When moving from one side of the helicopter to the other, move around the front of the aircraft. Do not under it and certainly not behind it. Upon arrival at the scene where hazardous materials are involved, you should park the ambulance. Remember, um, how are you going to park the ambulance? How are you going to park the helicopter as well? What's the number one rule? So A, at the scene of a hazardous materials incident, the ambulance should be parked uphill and upwind from the scene. Other locations may expose the ambulance to any escaping hazardous material. Be prepared to quickly move the ambulance if the, sh the wind shifts in your direction.